Through many births I have wandered on and on, searching for, but never finding, the builder of this house. This unattributed quote is hidden away in the starting area of The Witness, the 2016 Mist-esque puzzle game from Braid developer Jonathan Blow and the team at Thecla, and I think betrays, at least in part, the deeper meaning of this beautiful puzzler. After years of interest in the witness had built to a boiling point and I was finally forced, either by chance or divine providence, to actually boot up the game and begin my journey, I was struck by the profoundly religious feeling of the game. And I don't mean that the game has some sort of thoughtful or philosophical meaning it's trying to convey to you, because it does, but I mean that the game feels itself an awful lot like a spiritual journey, reminiscent of the soul's journey to salvation in any number of faiths. Now, there have already been plenty of folks more intelligent than I who have done their best to break down the deeper philosophical meanings in The Witness, so I'm not going to immediately begin with any of that. But instead, I want to start with a discussion of, in theological terms, the physical world of The Witness itself and how it aids and guides you along its spiritual journey. General revelation is a term theologians use to describe the idea that knowledge of God, or the spiritual world more generally, is made plainly available to us by the natural world and by reason. Adherence to the idea of intelligent design, or more simply, the idea that the world and its inhabitants were not created by chance but as part of a deliberate act of creation, use the idea of general revelation as an indicator that God exists. The curving path of a stream, the gentle swaying of trees, the lapping of waves against the shore, all reveal the existence of a spiritual world beyond man. In The Witness, this revelation manifests as solutions to the island's puzzles. Perhaps a solution can be seen in the branches of a nearby tree, or even across the harbor in a row of palms. The makers of the island, be they the in-universe creators or the real-world developers of the game, i.e. Jonathan Blow and company, made all the clues plainly available, if you have eyes to see and ears to hear, as it were. In picturing the island's makers as the gods of that world and you, the player, either in the game or in real life, the subject of the world they designed, they have offered you everything you need to solve the puzzle that is the island of the witness. Now, one could argue that this logic exists in all puzzle games, but I'd say that The Witness is different if for no other reason than how it immerses you in the world. The only text prompt that ever appeared on my screen was the one that told me the button controls for how to run. Never was I prompted with clues or hints. There was no companion to whisper ideas in my ear, no stray documents with insight into the design of the myriad square panels that along with their miles of cable crisscrossed the island in spiderweb-like fashion. The island is the only clue, and you must observe the nuance of the island to find a way out. Here's a few examples. Hidden in a bamboo forest were a series of puzzles, with no obvious visual clues as to their solutions. And as I was wandering through the forest, looking for any indicators that might lead me to the puzzle's solutions, I noticed something I hadn't heard before. Birdsong. And not just any random birdsong, but birdsong in patterns. Suddenly, the solution seemed so obvious. Looking at each puzzle would trigger a new birdsong or other aural clue that revealed the solutions through the maze. Similarly, there's an area with a quartet of hedge mazes, three of which have fairly obvious visual indicators as to what path you should take, but one had no visual indicators. Instead, another aural clue. The sound of the gravel beneath your feet changed when I was on the right path through the maze. It took me a couple minutes to cue in on the change in sound, but it was there the whole time, from the moment I stepped foot into that hedge maze. I just needed to listen. Now, even though the solutions are all around you, like with these examples, I'd regularly come across one puzzle or another that would take me anywhere from minutes to hours to days to solve. But isn't that the way with any spiritual journey? Various statues adorn the island landscape, and many of them are reaching out for something. Grasping out into the ether for meaning, for an answer, for an escape from the island. Much as we, the player, are reaching out for answers to the island's puzzles, looking for a greater purpose. As the late Rush drummer and philosopher Neil Peart once said, no one gets to heaven without a fight. And sometimes the solution to the puzzle really does feel like a fight. 
There is, however, a second way the witness draws attention to the intent of its makers, through a process which theologians call special revelation. This, unlike general revelation, where the world is revealed by natural means, is knowledge brought about by supernatural means, usually via miracles or scripture, the latter of which theologians would say is supernatural in nature because all scripture is said to be the direct words of their respective deity, be they the Bible, the Quran, the Bhagavad Gita, or any number of other holy texts. As some puzzle solutions are revealed by the general revelation of the island of the witness, some puzzles involve other contextual clues, images within the puzzles themselves. Themselves. Getting the puzzles wrong triggers the symbols in certain ways, lending clarity to their design. But there is another example of special revelation in the witness, unrelated to the island's puzzles. This revelation is more specifically revealing the ideas behind the world of the witness, scriptures about the design and intent of the island. Collections of audio and video recordings hidden around the island serve as the witness holy texts each having been carefully selected by Blow and his team to provide special insight into their intent for the player's experiences within the game. But unlike Bennett Foddy's monologues in Getting Over It, the scriptures of The Witness are not the direct words of Jonathan Blow. The recordings in question cover a range of topics from a variety of authors and time periods, but two key ideas emerge from the bunch. A focus on observation and stillness, and an interest in Zen philosophy. Zen is explicitly mentioned in a number of recordings, but many others more broadly address the praiseworthiness of stopping to just sit back and observe the world around us. This latter idea is most profoundly stated in a reading of astronaut Russell Swikert's observations of their time orbiting around the Earth in March of 1969. Now this is a long quote, so just stick with me. You look down there and you can't imagine how many borders and boundaries you crossed again and again and again. And you don't even see them. At the wake-up scene, the Mideast, you know there are hundreds of people killing each other over some imaginary line that you can't see. And from where you see it, the thing is a whole, and it's so beautiful. And you wish you could just take one from each side and hand and say, look at it from this perspective. Look at that. What's important? And so a little later on, your friend, again those same neighbors, another astronaut, the person next to you, goes out to the moon. And now he looks back and sees the Earth not as something big, where he can see the beautiful details, but he sees Earth as a small thing out there. And now that contrast between the bright blue and white Christmas tree ornament and that black sky, that infinite universe, really comes through. The size of it, the significance of it, it becomes both things. It becomes so small and so fragile and such a precious little spot in that universe that you can block it out with your thumb. And you realize that on that small spot, that little blue and white thing is everything that means anything to you. All of history and music and poetry and art and war and death and birth and love, tears, joy, games, all of it on that little spot out there you can cover with your thumb. The whole passage of text was transcribed from an impromptu speech Swikert gave at a 1975 meeting on planetary culture in Lindisfarne, Long Island. Swikert concluded his speech with this poem from E.E. E. Cummings. I thank you, God, for most this amazing day, for the leaping greenly spirits of trees, and a blue true dream of sky, and for everything which is natural, which is infinite, which is yes. I asked in a previous video about the narrative design of Remedy Entertainment's 2019 title Control if our obsessions defined us. I'd argue that The Witness, by its own design and own internal admission, is obsessed with Zen philosophy, and as such somewhat defines itself by its obsessions. There are two ways to complete your journey in The Witness, each of which are huddled within the cycle of death, rebirth, and eventual enlightenment we could generally define as Zen Buddhism. The primary ending, the one that will earn you an achievement for your troubles, finds the end of your journey in a glass elevator. But instead of ascending into the heavens, the vessel takes you back across the island to the dimly lit corridor out of which you first emerged during your very first moments with the witness. This ending recalls that very first audio log. Through many births I have wandered on and on, searching for, but never finding, the builder of this house. At first blush, this ending is difficult not to read as tragic. Not only does this carriage take you so thoughtlessly back to your origin, but also gives you many opportunities to see all your meticulously solved puzzles fade to black. 
as the power to their panels fades and doors once opened now slam shut as you're carried back across the island, an unwitting participant in this Sisyphean experiment. But as the witness has shown, we're not meant to view this ending as a Greek tragedy, but as another opportunity to achieve enlightenment. It's a chance to try again. Maybe in our quest to solve the puzzle of the island, we missed something. The island was trying to reveal something to us, but we missed it. If the first ending of The Witness can be seen as reincarnation, the second ending is enlightenment, and it's actually right back at the start of your journey. And although you could never be reasonably expected to discover this enlightenment on your first journey across the island, it becomes almost too obvious during your second, now that the island has revealed enough for you to see it. In a 2016 video titled The Unbearable Now, an interpretation of The Witness, Joel Goodwin posited this to be the stop looking, start seeing mentality of The Witness. And much like any number of faiths practiced by millions worldwide, that is much the idea behind humankind's relationship with the supernatural. Stop looking, start seeing. This enlightenment solution opens up a passage out of the island and passing through the corridors of the witness-only exit will lead you to a space beyond space, and eventually still, back to the real world. This second ending, the Enlightenment ending, breaks the fourth wall of the witness and switches to first-person footage of someone untethering themselves from a computer, akin to how Neo emerges into the real world in 1999's The Matrix, and is just another of many moments in the witness that point back to its creators. Unlike other games, where fingerprints of the developers can be seen here and there, everything about the world of The Witness directs your attention to the hands that made it. Hey everybody, this is Jake Terrio with Subpixel. If you've made it this far, hopefully it means you enjoyed that video that you just watched. So if you could leave a like and a comment and subscribe if you're not subscribed already, that lets us and our robot overlords at YouTube know that this video is worth watching. So thank you for that, and we'll see you next time.